Good morning. I'm Chuck Riley, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Engineering and Computer Science, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this seminar this morning by Michelle Markham, the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for HD Supply. As I said, Michelle Markham is the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for HD Supply, driving an information technology strategy that enables business growth through simplification for customer improved customer service, digitization for business process efficiency, and systems integration for cost productivity. Since H HD Supply's successful divestiture from the Home Depot in 2007, her team has executed on multi-generation plans <coughs> for each of the company's 10 business units, established a world-class infrastructure capability, and created a culture of innovation and teamwork. She and her team support information technology for more than 17,000 associates across 900 locations in the United States and Canada. Prior to joining HD Supply in 2005, Ms. Markham built a successful 20-year career with General Electric, holding a variety of finance, business, and IT leadership positions. Ms. Markham holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from Siena College and an MBA from Union College in New York. She's a graduate of the GE Financial Management Program and the GE Experienced Finance Leadership Program. And she's here this morning to talk to us about building a world-class team. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Michelle Markham. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Welcome. Thanks very much. Bob and Chuck, thanks so much for the introduction and uh, allowing me to be here this morning. I really uh, loved the opportunity to get to meet individuals like yourselves that are really just embarking on your careers and saying, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'm asking the same question still, just so you know. Uh, but I've been at HC Supply going on six years now and have had a fantastic ride. It's pretty much like a roller coaster ride every day. Uh, I also have uh, with me today uh, one of my teammates, uh, Vic, is here to uh, make sure everything was running smoothly and he makes sure all our things like this go smoothly. So I want to say thanks for Vic for being here. And my better half, uh, Jeff Kowal, is here as well. So he can help me navigate to your campus, because it is very complex So and early in the morning. So thanks so much for being here and your support. Uh, so this morning, I thought I'd talk about uh, three different areas. Uh, one, a little bit about my career, my background. Why do I have the privilege to take your time this morning? Uh, how did I get to do what I get to do every day? I thought that might be of some interest to you, particularly about the learnings over my career. I think that's so important that every opportunity you have to learn, you put that learning in your toolkit. And that will really form who you are and what your passion's about and why you may grow into a bigger leadership role at some point. Uh, the second area of focus will be around HD Supply, a little bit about our company. I'm so proud to be on the senior staff at HD Supply. The CEO, Joe D'Angelo, I've been working with for 12 years in my career now. He's an incredible inspiration to me every day. He has enormous energy and passion about what we do and really knows how to bring incredible teams together. And then the third area of concentration is a little bit more about my team and what we get to do every day around taking care of customers and innovation. So we thought we'd share a little bit about that and then we'll certainly have time for questions. So uh, we'll proceed. So my career uh, began a long, long time ago, uh, finished uh, school, and then after school, I had an opportunity to go work for GE. And what you're going to see on this slide, uh, for your knowledge, is there's three tiers here. First is individual contributor. As I began my career, I was an individual contributor. I was a part of a larger organization. And then you can see I'll move into leadership and executive roles over my career. And I thought I'd organize it like this so that you can see there is a progression to people's career. Now, it doesn't have to be a certain roadmap. Uh, that's changed a lot over the last several years. People that wanted CIO roles might have started out in technology and have very specific ways to get there. The interesting thing you'll see is my career is becoming more common with CIOs today that they want to have more business acumen and so they actually do more cross-functional. So in the blue at the bottom is the education I was afforded during that time at GE. So it was the finance management program. I also took some real estate sales training because I thought I wanted to go in sales back in the day. So it was pretty, uh, pretty fun. Now when I began at GE Ordnance, this is the division that we would build uh, nuclear missiles, or actually the fire control system and the guidance system for nuclear missiles. And as a woman, back in that day, no one was on the ships. We never were out with the 
sailors. So it was very unusual for women to have access to all that information. So I began my journey as a technical writer. And the fun part about that for me was we had about six women in our department and about 100 ex-sailors. So people often ask me how I got uh, so sassy so early in my career. I really had to hold my own with these guys. So I don't know if you have any friends or family in the military, uh, but they want, they're pretty direct. And so they're a lot of fun and I learned a lot. I also learned early on there were a number of men that were working hard every day in their jobs, but they weren't inspired by it. And that was really something I reflected on for a long time. And I said, why are you here? And of course they had families to support. And I learned that I never want to come in and do a job just because I have to pay the bills. I want to do something that really resonates with me personally. So there are a couple key learnings there. Uh, then I went over to uh, GE Plastics and got to do systems training. Now, the person that I actually got to work with early in my career, you might know his name, is Jeff Immelt. He runs GE today. Jeff was heading up new business development back in the day. And he was a very collaborative leader and would invite you know, non-sales people to his events. And you would go there and you would learn more about the business than you ever taught them about computer systems. So together we grew up and we learned together. And it was a really fantastic environment to foster uh, learning. So from that, you can see at the top, these are just some areas of learnings I had. I had to learn how to be a better communicator. I had to learn how, what my audience was looking for when I was doing systems training. And then I also moved over into finance at that time. I got recruited into the financial management program. One of the leaders saw that I had some financial acumen, so they thought I'd be interested and moved into that program. I proceeded down to Louisville, Kentucky uh, several years later and took several positions all of which was on a CFO track for me, because that's what I thought I wanted to do. I really enjoyed all of the disciplines of finance, all the technical learnings there. And so as we, I was learning all of that, I also had the chance to support the CIO. Now the CIO said, well, geez, I have a job here in IT. So I actually got pulled back into technology uh, because I was serving one of my clients very well. And in these positions, I had many learnings as well. Team building was a big deal. And this is the point in my career that I will tell you, I began to truly value inspirational leaders and how they built teams. The CIO at the time would bring in a masseuse to rub the necks of the IT team to make sure they weren't stressed out. He would have a popcorn machine in the back with a webcam to make sure it was always full. He really wanted to make the environment fun because IT folks, of course, have to work around the clock. But I really learned quite a bit, and this is an inspiration to this day. I'm always trying to do things like Greg did many, many years ago. So what you can see here is each year, or every portion of my career, there was some formal training and education. There was on-the-job training, and then there's learnings that you got out of it. I then moved to GE Capital uh, with Joe D'Angelo. Now, Joe D'Angelo is our CEO today at HD Supply. Joe was running the e-commerce and was the chief operating officer at GE Appliances. And he called me one afternoon before he took this position at GE Capital. And he says, Shell, are you mobile? Can you move? I said, yeah, where are we going? I can't tell you, I'll tell you next week. And that's how I was pulled into my next assignment and my first CIO position was with Joe. And we went up to Pennsylvania to run the GE leasing business, a modular and tip space where we sold and, and leased uh, trailers. Uh, so very interesting business. And here I inherited a team of only about 50 people. And those individuals were really stifled. They had so many awesome ideas. But the prior leadership was a very command and control style person. And they were very formal. Uh, I'm, I'm formal uh, and disciplined about things, but I would say I want to create an environment where people can give you feedback all the time. So here, I had an opportunity to further my skills and help change the culture there so people could feel confident about what they were doing all the time. Uh, from that point forward, um, I had a change in my career. And you're like, what happened to her? Here she is, she moves into individual roles, into leadership assignments, and then she's an executive. And now she's back into just to a leadership role? Well, here's what happened. My dad passed away. I had a life-changing event. My dad was very close to me. And hopefully none of you have had any difficult life-changing events, but I'm sure many of you have had those experiences. And I think what you have to do sometimes is reflect on, are you able to give it all to the team? Can you provide the energy and the inspiration to others while you're going through a time in your life where you don't have it in you? 
So I chose to step down from my role and move into a role that allowed me to do something I could do in my sleep. I could do cost productivity and indirect sourcing and procuring. I had done that for years in finance, and I was really good at it. And I could do it without the energy uh, that I had to have to run a team. So when Joe went to Home Depot, he said, Shell, I know you're going through this tough time right now. You let me know when you're ready. When you're ready to leave and you're ready to take on a big leadership assignment, I'm here. I know what you can do. And when you feel healed again, call me. And so that's what I did, actually, to take uh, and these were other learnings, of course. That's what I did at HC Supply. This is how the conversation went. Actually, it was an email. I said, hi, Joe. I'm ready. I didn't say, how's the family? How's it going? Anything. I was just that lucky and fortunate to have somebody that I worked for for all them years to know that I had what it took to bring this team together. And so from that point forward, uh, that Saturday, I was in interviewing uh, with the CEO of Home Depot at the time and was offered a position uh, right thereafter. So that is a very abbreviated view of what I've had a chance to do in my career. But I really wanted to share that with you briefly. And I'm glad to take questions later on. Because I think it's important that you see, I had five different businesses I worked at at GE during my 18-year career. And I had five different functional areas that I had the opportunity to work in. And that cross-functional experience allowed me to better understand the customers I serve each and every day. And as an IT professional, we're all about service. And how do you serve customers if you don't know what they need? So you really needed to understand the business and the business acumen needed to be developed. So the takeaway is about lifelong lessons. And these are mine. And I'm sure you'll create your own. But you've got a toolbox that you're going to want to fill up as you go through your career. And even your educational form. I'm sure you're on teams, whether they're academic uh, or music or other areas. You're on groups, and with that comes some dynamics. It's important that you understand, do you do great with teams, or do you prefer to do things as an individual? Those, there's not a right or wrong, but it's important to know yourself and be true to yourself. Don't pretend that you could do something that doesn't line up with your own personal values. So these are some of my lifelong lessons I thought I'd share with you, and it's important to put them into your toolbox. My favorite part on this is really the takeaway to love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. Now, I'm sure many of you heard this, but I was so naive early in my career that one of our national sales managers actually told me this, and I thought he created the phase, phrase. I did. I said, really? That's a fantastic thing. And of course, so many people pre prior to him had said that. Uh, I didn't know that, but I was quite inspired by it. And I've had the chance to love what I do every day during my career so far. So I wanted to move on a little bit about the business uh, and the HD supply and where we came from. And it's a very busy chart. It's not intended to read all the little icons that are up there. But this is how HD supply came together. We've had over 40 acquisitions over the last several years. Now, if you've ever moved from your hometown or you had to move when you were young to another area and meet new team members and new family members uh, or, or uh, others in the community, you'd have to adjust your style a little bit. Because maybe the way they did something in Kansas is this different than they do it in Florida. Well, that's the same thing when you bring all these companies together. You've got all these different styles, and you're smashing them all together, and you're saying, just play nice together, everyone. It's not quite so simple. So it's been very busy smashing all these companies together so that we could form one team at HD Supply. We've also divested some businesses over the years. But it created a very complex IT environment, as you can imagine. So our company is really about wholesale distribution. Uh, we're made up of uh, nine different business units in Canada. Uh, we have about 14,000 employees now, actually, with the recent divestiture of plumbing. Uh, we, across the United States and Canada is where we participate. About a million SKUs, or 400,000 customers that we serve each and every day. And then we have about $7 billion in revenue. So it's a very diverse uh, business unit that we're serving. And this is how it works. And these are a couple photographs of product that we sell for you. So if you've ever seen a new construction site out there where people just clear the land, first thing's got to go are the trees or anything in the way. And then you'll see the bulldozers come in, and they start to dig up the land. And then they got to put the pipe in the ground before the, bu the buildings go up. So if you've ever seen a new neighborhood, that's what you'd see. So we have a lot of products that are underground. So you want to bring water into a facility, wastewater out of a facility. That's part of our product portfolio. You'll also want to start sanding up those walls of a commercial building. So you've got concrete and rebar. 
in our white cap business is very interesting. If any of you like tools, this is really uh, the place to go. It's got really heavy duty tools and equipment. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. And then you move into the interior of a facility and you start running the electrical wire and cabling and the lighting and the plumbing fixtures and all of that. So the whole process from the time you start a construction product to the time the commercial property would be per turned over uh, to an owner is really the products that we sell into the community. And it's all across the United States. So it's pretty interesting. The other area that we sell is the electrical utilities. So the power grids around the nation, they have to be repaired. We sell a lot of products, specialized things. Industrial pipe valves and fittings is another business that's fun. We sell into the chemical industry. So if you've got a BP or Chevron running those really big facilities, they have very specialized pipes, valves, and fittings to make them run. And we sell all that product. So the thing that's really important around our company that I wanted to start off our discussion on teams was the foundation of who we are. And I'll tell you, I can teach most people anything about technology, leadership skills, business acumen, and I can learn a lot of things, and I know you can teach me a lot about your disciplines. The one thing I'll tell you you can't teach is values. You either have it or you don't. And I would just encourage all of you as you embark on your careers, find a company that has values lined up with yours. You know, integrity, you either have it or you don't. There's no middle ground with those things. So this is our foundation of our house at HD Supply. And because I line up so well with the values and with my boss, it's easy for me to come into this company and say, how do we build an incredible team? So we have our mission about one team working together to bring value to our customers. And obviously, we're a for-profit company, so we want to make money at that. But those way we go about doing it, uh, doing it with integrity, with respect, making sure we focus on service and innovation is awfully critical. And I felt it was that important for you to see this foundation because I wouldn't have been able to build the successful team that we have at HD Supply without this foundation. So I want to move on to building world-class teams a little bit for you. And these are a couple quotes uh, from Colin Paulo. I think over your life you will identify with different leaders and decide who are you similar to. Now he's got a really great a toolkit out there on the line is a leadership primer if you haven't had a chance to see it. And uh, the first one is, uh, you know, as a leader, sometimes you're just going to piss people off. And I thought that was pretty interesting because, yeah, you're not pleasing the crowds all the time. But uh, these are some of the leadership lessons I think are awfully important as you go about building teams. The first one being organization doesn't really accomplish anything. Only by getting the best people do you accomplish great deeds. It seems so simple when it's in print, doesn't it? But it's so important. If you don't have the right team around you, you can't win the game. So you've got to be thinking about that all the time. Think about the people you spend time with. Are they making you a best, better you? And if they're not, find some new people to hang out with. Who's the you you want to become? And make sure you can be the best. The other one on Lesson 9 was org charts and fancy titles. Count for next to nothing. When people come in and interview with me and they say, how can I become a director? Pretty quickly, I can assess that they're not as interested in the work content and taking care of the business and the team. They're really interested in fancy titles. Now, titles are interesting, but they don't get the work done. So this is another area that really resonated with me. And I found a lot of people are interested in titles. And that's OK. But the work and the people are more important. And then the other one in Lesson 12 is perpetual optimism, being a force multiplier. I can tell you personally, I get to wake up every day pretty charged up. I have a, a good level of energy all the time. And this is very effective. It spills over. People know that you're charged and energized about the work and the team uh, when you have this optimism. Now, you have to be realistic. You can't pretend it's all warm and fuzzy all the time but it's important that you are optimistic about the roles we play. So the next slide I wanted to share was about the expectations that I've put forth to my staff. So those were a little core about who I am and how that lines up with uh, the general. But this is important too. And these are non-negotiables. So my first couple weeks on the job when we acquired Hughes Supply here in Orlando, I talked to the team and I said, here's the deal. This is what I expect of you as the leadership team. And if this isn't something you can sign up for, I respect that. But you should go elsewhere. 
you have to embrace these leadership essentials from my seat. Uh, first one being being a partner with the business, uh, making sure that you understand the technology group is not a bucket of cost, an unnecessary evil. We're going to enable business growth and success. Uh, communication is critical. You've got to communicate up, sideways, and down, and you have to do it effectively. And you know what? You can't change the people you're talking to. You can only change how you react and how you alter your conversation around that. Very critical that the leader realizes their role and responsibility is to alter their style to be most effective. And make sure you have the external view of the customer all the time. That's critical. Again, how do you serve if you don't know what they need every day? And then on the right side, this isn't really meant to be read in detail. It's just organizing how I set goals and objectives every year. I have four categories. It's around people is first and how we develop talent. A two is strategic direction of the company. Three is project execution. And four is your financial commitment. It's the same things every year for the last six years since I've been here. And that's kept us on course. Now, the next area I wanted to talk a little bit about is the business of business. Because I think to be an effective IT contributor, you have to get what business is all about. Now, there are a number of jobs in the world that are awfully critical that are outside of the for-profit world of business. Uh, the education sector, for one, being here today. The non-for-profit is awfully important to our communities and society. And then you've got R&D, which is just a whole other opportunity for many of you. But when it comes to running a business or being a part of a business community, if you want to have a seat at the table, if you want to influence change and lead, you have to understand the business. And it's not that tricky. Being an ex-finance person, I could tell you most people in technology would say, well, it's complicated. I said, it's not any more complicated than technology. You know, break it down. You can learn it. Sometimes there's an aura around things we don't understand, such as finance. Uh, but this is about uh, knowing your customer, understanding the competitors, knowing the market that you play in, and make sure that you understand the numbers. So these are a couple slides that, again, you're not really to understand all the content on it. It's just the framework. This is a slide I use every year to take a look at my internal customers. We have nine business units. They all have different revenue, different number of employees, different number of locations, different number of systems they run. They play in different markets all the time. They have different competitors. There's complexity here. And you don't want to be intimidated by it, but be real about it. So understand who you serve internally and then who they serve externally. The next area of focus is those competitors out there. Just think about you trying to get into UCF as a student, who you had to compete with. And when you go to try and get a job, who are you competing with? Do you understand your competition? Do you know what they're doing to prepare? Because you should. Because that's going to be the advantage for you if you understand what's going out there. So as a business leader, you need to understand who we compete with and what kind of technology they bring into the table. And can we leapfrog that, or are we at parity? The next area to focus on is the market. Now, if any of you uh, have uh, got apartments right now that you're living on versus maybe campus housing, you're going to know that the trying to find an apartment today is a lot tougher than it would have been maybe four or five years ago. And why is that? Because in our market, the wholesale, the construction industry we sell into, um, the market has tanked. New housing starts are a fraction of what they were, down by 60% or more. So what's happening is people that had homes or foreclosing on them because they can't afford them, are moving into apartments. So the demand for apartments is up. And so there's a tighter market, so pricing's probably gone up for those of you that are in that situation. So this is our market. Uh, the thing about it is that our boss talked to us is, hey, everybody's in the market, even the competitors. So don't be afraid of it. Do what you can and respond to it. But don't be naive about it. Uh, I had some colleagues in IT years ago that were surprised that budgets were getting cut. And you're like, well, why would you be surprised? The market's shifted. You should pay attention to that. So this is an important piece as a strategic effort. And the last piece is knowing the numbers. If you don't understand how to read a P&L and you want to work in a business that's for profit, or even the nonprofits, because they have to raise funding too, you know, learn about this. It's pretty fundamental. And I bet you all have a checkbook. And you all have household expenses. So you have to know how are you getting money into the budget? Where are you using it? And what's left over at the end of every day? You all manage a budget each and every day. Numbers at companies tend to be a little bigger with a few more zeros. So don't be afraid of them, but make sure you take time to learn it. 
So that's kind of the business of business. And I think that the role of IT when it comes to business is shifting. When we began our journey as IT professionals, we were really order takers. It's kind of years ago, engineering and manufacturing. Engineering would design something, throw it over a wall, say manufacturing, guys, go build it, make it work. And it didn't work so easily all the time. Well, in IT, it's been the same way for a lot of years. We are order takers. But as we shift into a partnership role, it's important that we best understand our customers. So if someone comes in and says, yeah, I want a Big Mac, and you see that they're working hard, one of their personal goals is to get their cholesterol down, you're like, you know, Joe, you really need a turkey sandwich today. Let me get to that. So the idea about partnership is making sure you know what they need versus what they want. Okay? And then as you go through a maturity curve, you become an innovator. You really anticipate what that customer might need. So if you've got your buddy Joe trying to work on his health and his cholesterol, maybe you as an innovator find a way each week to say, let's go walk around Lake Eola together and help inspire him to reach his health goals. So it can be translated to all areas, whether it's technology for business or in your personal lives. But I think it's awfully important that you see there's been a shift. And I think that the takeaway here, which will be difficult to read in the back, you really need to be a business thinker first and a technologist second. And that was pretty much what I told my staff when we began our journey. Now, the business of IT is very interesting as well uh, because we have to align with the business goals. We have to understand what partnership means. We have to get the right talent in, and we have to empower them. We can't stifle them. If they've got a good idea, don't knock it down. Listen to it. It may not be appropriate for today, but keep it in the hopper. Let's at least hear them out and figure out how it fits in the strategic vision of the company. We also have processes we have to work through, but no bureaucracy. You know, coming from General Electric, a 100-year-old company, 100 billion plus, it's pretty big. It can get kind of bureaucratic sometimes, but it's not unusual for large companies. The key for us at HT Supply is how do we get bigger but not put a lot of bureaucracy in there, make sure it stays simple and lean. And that's an important part of the IT processes. And then make sure that we continue to execute and plan and communicate and communicate again. Because even though we share our messages with the employee base, we might have to say it two or three times for people to embrace that as their own. Now this slide I wanted to, this is part of my value slide for IT. I use this at every employee meeting, but I made it a little special for you today because I wanted to concentrate a little time on this top sector. I only have three steps for value creation in IT. This is the first one, and it's about the team. And I thought it's that important for all of you to kind of think, well, how do you go about getting people inspired on your team? And we do this by making sure we hire the best talent. You have to have technical aptitude. But you also have to want to win. You have to have a winning spirit. You have to be collaborative. You have to have good personal energy. So how we do it at HD Supply is in three steps, doing, learning, and winning, you saw on a previous slide. The area of doing is how do we do what we do. Now I have nine staff members that each line up with a business unit. So when I talk about the electrical utilities business, for example, Darla runs that business and that IT shop and all the applications that serve that customer base. She owns it. And then behind her, she's got a team of about 150 IT employees that run the enterprise. And that's how we organize so that we make sure we're effective and we do things right for the whole organization. Uh, we also have about 200 projects annually to get done. We do technology reviews and we include a lot of people so you can learn about the technology stack. And again, global talent's key. We have about 73% of uh, the total workforce for HD Supply IT are our employees. The other 27% are consultants, some onshore and some offshore. And I think that we've got brilliant minds around the world, and I think we should tap into them, and that's what we do. So we really have a very different model than we would have several years ago. We also promote uh, working remote as appropriate. Uh, my head of architecture, my head of security, don't sit in Orlando, Florida. They sit remotely because they are the best talent available for our company, and that's where they happen to live. And we figure it out so we can work collaboratively together. The next area to focus on is learning. So once we get all this great stuff done, how do we learn from it? And the learning part is probably the most critical part of our success story. It's all about continuous improvement, and it's making sure the team knows not to be afraid if they make a mistake. And I'll tell you, when I came down to the Orlando area and we acquired Hughes, uh, it was a very different culture 
Uh, the IT team wasn't as empowered as I would have liked, and so we evolved that a little bit so that they knew we were going to listen to them. So if they said, we're not ready to go live with the system launch, we don't go live. In the past, we went live because it was a deadline. And then what happens if you do it poorly? You have to undo it, and you do it again, and it takes longer. So that was a significant change that we really were going to create a learning culture. Now, when we do learnings, there's several ways to do that. A lunch and learn is where people come in and share an idea, and you've probably done something like that. I have round tables with uh, everyone for their birthdays each month. We take a, each month a group together, I have a round table. Uh, we also do technical conferences. Several of the IT professionals are actually asked to speak about database or architectural structures, and uh, I get to read all those presentations and learn a little bit more, so that's fun. Uh, annual performance reviews. I'm not sure a process here where you get feedback. I'm sure through your, uh, your teachers all the time, how you doing, you know your grades, that type of stuff. But it's more personal than that. We sit down each year formally and make sure that people understand where do you want to go, what skills do you have, what are the gaps, and what are we going to do together to help you grow. So we've got a lot of training uh, newsletters available. And then the last element of our, our culture is winning and celebrating these successes. And we do a lot of this. I would say IT is the role model within HD Supply. Everyone's always jealous. We don't do massages, really, like my other boss had done. But we do a lot of things, a lot of events. Uh, we do fundraisers together. And we go to different locations to give back to our community. That really brings the team together because we really want to find time to do that. And it's important to so many people. I do a lot of personal thank you notes. Uh, my staff, I send their spouses you know, flowers for their birthday or something. Because at the end of the day, if the family understands the expectation of my staff and I make personal time available for them, then we get to know each other better and we know it's important not only for the employee but for those families. And I encourage my staff to know a lot about their teams. And if you understand what motivates somebody, then you're going to be more personal on how you're going to inspire that individual. So some people, for example, on our team live about an hour or so away up in Daytona. And years ago, they had to drive every single day here to the Orlando office. And we said, well, why don't you work from home Mondays and Friday? How would that work for you? Well, that is huge. And you find people actually work more hours and do more for you because you're working with them. Or you have the kids got an event in the morning, and they want to be there for their recital or some meeting. Absolutely, you should be there. And so what? You work an hour later in the day to, to figure out how to get the work done. You've got to be flexible with the workforce and make sure that you're listening to what their needs are. And the loyalty you build is extraordinary. So these are some examples on how we do some celebrations around our success. We have a lot of successes. Those 200 projects you saw a year, uh, they are all successes. Uh, we keep compressing cycle time to get things done, but we don't do rework. That's a real important part of who we are as an IT team. And so the message I want to leave you with on this slide is really about uh, empowering your team trusting the team and teaching them to build that loyalty. And I'll tell you, trust is an important part of this. I have to trust the team on the field every day because I have to get a job done through these individuals. But who don't they have to trust when I walk in? Me. I have to earn that. I have to earn it by my actions and make sure when I say, go take the time off to be with your family to do something, that when I see them again, I said, how is that trip? How did the, the little guy like Disney? How did so-and-so like being a princess over there? Or whatever it is that's important to them. I have to follow up with that. I have to care. And it's easy for me because it's an amazing organization. So I get to uh, enjoy not only the team every day, uh, but I get to enjoy a lot of their families. So in my office hangs a big photo collage of all the young children uh, from my staff and others, and I call it my IT pipeline. So I'm starting to recruit very early, uh, even when they're just born. So the next pieces of my value creation slide, uh, first being the team, most important to me. Uh, the second is around our customers. How do we know what they need? And this is the model that uh, was teed up around simplification. When you go into a store, you go into uh, Walmart or Target or Home Depot or wherever, you want the buying experience to be easy and simple and not a hassle, right? Or if you go online, I know no one has any patience anymore to go online uh, if it's hassle. So this is what it's about for us. 
And so for us, we have to be out in the field, we have to be at a branch location or a DC, and make sure we understand how's that buying experience and make it as easy as possible. And then we also have to make sure we make money at the end of the day and create value for our company. So IT role in that is around digitizing processes. So when we began our journey, we had over 12 human resources systems, 12 payroll systems, probably not the most efficient use of our time. So of course, we brought all that together. That's an example of digitization. So you do things once, and you do it well. Integration for cost productivity for IT is about bringing together all the back-end technology. So we used to have 18, 19 email domains. We have one. Could you imagine when I started? I couldn't find anybody in the company. There was no email. Could you imagine today not being able to locate somebody on the web? It's, it's unheard of. So we did a lot of work to bring that together. We had over 22 data centers. We've collapsed down to two. Disaster recovery, telephony, the networks, security. I had no security for all intents and purposes. It was an open kimono. Come on in, anybody. Come on in, join our network. We had to button that down a little bit, as you imagine. So we've done a lot. And the fourth uh, thing that we put here was innovation for a competitive advantage. And we just kind of launched that pillar a couple years ago. The intention there is twofold. One is around IT innovation. How do we continue to grow our company without adding all the costs back that we've taken out? And then two, how do we bring new ideas to customers to make it easier for them so we might keep them with us at HD Supply? Now this slide's a slide I've used with my board of directors. And the reason I wanted to bring it to your attention quickly was on the top left is really the journey we've been on since I joined the company. When I walked in, the business staff said, Shell, we need an IT strategy. And I said, if you can give me 90 days, I'll work on it. And that's what we've been working on ever since. So we want to rationalize our systems, integrate the back end, and create an innovative environment. And we do it through these different disciplines. On the right-hand side, we benchmarked our cost structure at HD Supply. Because as you get out into business, if you're in a functional area, whether it's sourcing, finance, IT, any other area, they're always going to say, well, you always want more money. And I'm like, of course we want more money, because we're going to do great stuff. But it's important that you understand how to demonstrate the value. And we benchmarked against other companies of our size. And you can see the light lines at the top, maybe. Those indicate kind of world-class metrics, and we're below that. So we're already running a really lean shop, and we're doing it very well. <coughs> now this slide is another walk slide, and you'll see this a lot in corporate America. On the left side are all the systems that we discovered as we brought all these companies together, over 500. Well, we said, do you really need four vir antivirus solutions? Do you really need you know, 18 email domains or 12 HR systems? Probably not. So we aggressively went forth and started to get rid of about 35%. We felt pretty good about ourselves. We said, we're kicking butt. We're cleaning the house. It's grand. Well, what's happened on the right side is the demand is enormous. So we have sales guys that want more technology. We have more e-business initiatives going on in the company. And the demand is off the charts. We have had the lion's share of the funding at HD Supply for three years running. This year, we have over 60% of all the capital, all the cash we're going to invest this year comes to IT. Last year was 85%. Now, I'll tell you, when you're in a down economy, that's unheard of. No one invests in a down economy unless you've got a really smart senior staff. And fortunately, I've got business leaders that are very, very smart. And they understand when you're in a down economy, you invest. So when the market comes back, you're ready to go. And you're not wasting time at that point. So this is just an example of what we've done to clean house and the demand that's coming back. And this is my vision slide for the technology stack. There's three layers that I look at. On the left side are various colors, because they're various businesses. So my belief is that you want to make sure that the, the solution you put up front with a customer is appropriate for that customer. So when you're going to walk into a Target, it's different than going to a Burger King. They probably have different point of sale systems for you. And that's necessary because they're serving different customers at that time. Same for us at HD Supply. Somebody to walk in to buy an electrical component is very different than when you want to get uh, a very, very long pipe that's out in a yard. It's just a very different buying experience. So we allow differentiation, and I support that on the front end. In the middle tier are all your shared applications. So we build it once, and we use it wherever it's appropriate, opt-in or opt-out. Now, an example here might be this. Our business called Facilities Maintenance is a catalog-based business out in San Diego. And they publish a really fat book 
uh, products every year. And once that's published, those are the prices that the customers are going to get. Now, just like JCPenney's and others over the years, you'll get some sales now and again. But most of the time, it's locked. Now, other businesses like electrical sell a lot of cable and copper wire. Well, the copper prices have fluctuated a lot over the last several years. So we need to be able to fluctuate our price as we sell product. And here we've got a tool called Zillion Pricing, which is one of those tools we built that allows a person at a counter to properly mark, uh, put the price out there with the market dynamics. They can opt in or opt out, so all businesses don't need to use those services. But on the right side, this is the non-negotiable. You will opt in to the shared infrastructure, the shared help desk, the shared human resources solutions, the shared financials. You don't need 12 tax teams. You need one. You have only one tax return to file for HD supply. You don't need people all over. So this is a way I've organized for our IT organization where everybody fits in the organization, because all three are critical to success. That foundation of the house needs to be very strong and available each and every day. OK, so I wanted to uh, kind of move into a couple examples on innovation. I think it's pretty fun what we get to do. This is one of our DCs, and it's pick to voice. So our IT team works with the guys at the distribution centers. Out there, we get an order. We have a clipboard. We have a piece of paper. We go up and down these aisles, and we pick off the shelves, put it in a box, put it in a back conveyor belt, box it up, UPS picks it up, bring it to a customer. That's what they do every day. Now, no more clipboard, no more paper. It's all on the voice. So it says, go to aisle 7, shelf 3, bin C. Pick 2. The person says, pick 2. It's done. On to the next. It's much more efficient, a lot less error. So that's kind of a neat technology thing we've done. Uh, not maybe progressive in other industries, but for us in our community, it's still pretty progressive. Another area is uh, mobile commerce. This is the first mover advantage for us. This is allowing our apartment managers who take care of your apartments, if any of you have one, if a new faucet needs to be put in. You'll call the guy. He needs a new faucet. They're going to go get it. Now he can go on his mobile device and buy it much more rapidly than flipping through that very big catalog. I really want to close uh, with these, uh, this slide here and shift into uh, some input I have for you on your careers. Uh, there's a couple different things uh, when you're looking at your career that you need to consider. Uh, most important, who owns it? And that would be you. So if anybody hasn't told you that nugget of wisdom, I'm going to let you know it's all on you. There's three groups. Uh, you're the most important part of it. I would be the top group called the organization. What do I owe you as an employee? I owe you a framework. I owe you feedback. I owe you training tools, opportunities to shine and tell us how great you are and what you do. That's my obligation to you, and that's what we've provided is our culture of a learning environment. The other one is the leader or the direct manager. They owe you feedback. If you're doing a great job, we should tell you. If you're not doing a great job, we should tell you that too. Because you'll never know how to fix anything or course correct if no one tells you. And what's really interesting is you become an employee, you're going to think that the boss knows everything that's good and bad. And we don't always. We don't do what you do every day. You've got to find your words to give feedback to the leadership so we can take appropriate action. If there's inappropriate behavior, we will stuff it out. But we can't do it if we don't know about it. So it's awfully important you find your voice to work with your leaders of the future and make sure they hear that from you. And then the third one is really on you. What are you passionate about? What do you love to do? What butters your bread every day when you get up in the morning? Figure that out. And that's the journey that you're going to be on. And I'll tell you, you're going to have a lot of fun. And you're going to be really great at it if you follow your heart on what really makes you uh, get up every day and have a good time. So again, that's uh, kind of my uh, input to you. And I would tell you my life's journey to close here today. Uh, this is how I hope to go out, uh, kind of slide in sideways and say, wow, what a ride. Because the journey I've been on so far has been extraordinary. And I'm very, very blessed and privileged every day to lead the IT organization at HD Supply. So with that, I want to say thank you for your time today. I hope a few of these things have resonated with uh, all of you out. And again, thanks for all your early morning attendance. That's uh, very impressive. So thank you. I think we've got some time for some questions. OK. How did you work with your management team to realize that you wanted to become in the leadership role instead of go technical, the technical ladder mm -hmm. to your leadership ladder? 
You know, I didn't. Um, I would tell you I've been a really opportunistic person. Some of you probably knew at four years old you wanted to do something. Some of you were born like that. Uh, I was born differently. I've been more opportunistic. So the opportunity for me was to go work at GE and work with uh, a really smart group of people and engineers particularly. I had to learn all about that discipline. And I think what happens over time is if you have a natural aptitude to bring teams together and inspire, doors open. And I would tell you that's how my whole career has gone. I really only interviewed officially for a couple jobs. So if you do the job you're in well, someone pulls you. Someone says, who, and again, if you've played on any teams or any groups, and you have to put a team together, and you say, who do you want on your team? You probably know who you want on the team. And why do you know that? Because that person demonstrates some skill that you need on your team or they bring the energy or the focus or the project management skills, whatever it might be. Um, so I would tell you I didn't know uh, and I still am surprised every day that I get to do this. It's so awesome. Uh, but I think early on I knew that I could, um, I would have a position on stuff. Uh, the first job was most interesting too because the Navy client, uh, was a gentleman of course, and the engineers were very afraid of him. They wouldn't want to tell him if he was wrong. You can't tell the customer they're wrong. Well, I was so naive. <laughs> I just told him, well, that's stupid. That's wrong. <laughs> and we didn't have uh, walls back in the day in the conference rooms. They were just like big cubicles. And they're I can't believe you told the customer he's wrong. I said, but he is. So I was so naive. Well, he thought that was extraordinary. Oh my god, you're absolutely right, he says to me. I ended up getting a promotion. Everybody's PO to me. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, you know, have, you got to go for it. Uh, so I guess I was just so honest about what I saw. And I do feel that it's an obligation when you see things that are good or bad to provide that feedback. So um, I would tell you I didn't know I had such an opportunity ahead of me. I just tried to do the right thing, I guess, along the way. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the mentors that you've had, the people that you look up to besides Colton Powell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, of course, he's in the press more, right? Uh, you know, I've had a lot of mentors, and I've tried with, we have a women's network at work, and we've tried actually assigning mentors to individuals that are working on skill development. Um, I think the challenge with assigned mentors, it's not natural. Um, so you've got to trust this person. Uh, so I've had uh, quite a few mentors. Uh, uh, Joe D'Angelo, who's my boss now, and I worked for for 12 years, has been a real big fan of mine, and I don't know why always, but I got lucky. And he encourages me to try things. And when I make a mistake, he's like, well, let's not do that again. I said, yeah, let's not. And you move on. And you learn from it. And you don't feel ostracized or put down. Uh, so that's awfully important. Uh, I had a, a woman that was in business with me many years ago who is incredibly brilliant. She it was in finance, uh, really, really sharp. And she was very inspirational to um, you know, show me that you can find a way to bring balance to your life and do what's important to you. So uh, I think she was pretty pretty awesome as well. So thank you. Please? Uh, you mentioned that you have a bachelor in uh, computer science. Yes. Like what influenced you to go and pursue an MBA? Yeah, the MBA was a, a really important step for me. Uh, computer science was very new when I started out a long time ago. We changed computer systems at the college I went to every year for all four years. And it was a lot of change, and I just knew that you know, that would be a draw. But the MBA for me was important because I was doing the finance program at GE, which was a technical program for finance people. Um, it's a pretty well-known program. And I was learning a lot, but there was a gap for me. And most of the gap was around teams and organizational behavior. How do you take your technical aptitude and talk with someone that doesn't understand financials? So I always would call it my mom test. If I could explain what I'm doing to my mom, whether I'm writing documents about nuclear missiles or something else, then I figured I'd learn to communicate. Uh, and the MBA program for me really rounded out more of the leadership aspect and uh, the, you know, understand the law when you need a lawyer, and then making sure that, uh, you know, you had other skills for team, team building. Yeah, that was awfully important. But technical is great, but you've got to put it into action at some point. Could you uh, relay your experience with UCS students and interns? Yeah, thanks for asking, Bob. I appreciate it. We've actually had 34 interns in the last four years come through HD Supply. We just started a program, of which 20 were UCF students. And we've actually hired 10 of those 20 students. 
uh, during the tenure. So we have a 12-week program in the summer, and they jump into the deep end and are assigned uh, really meaty assignments. And they're always assigned to people that uh, are probably our, even our, our up-and-coming talent to make sure that they've got a good uh, leader. And then we also buddy them up with someone to make sure that when you show up your first day, you know, where's the restroom? Where's the food? Where do you do things? And so we got to make sure they get around. Uh, but we've had an amazing program. Um, this last group that joined us this summer, every year it just gets better. You guys are so smart. And you come in and I'm like, wow, I better uh, look at retirement soon if you guys are all barking at the heels. So it's, it's extraordinary. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the books or research that you would suggest that the students uh, look into? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the books, it depends what you're, you're interested in. Uh, you know, leadership, there's lots of great books out there. Uh, Jack Welch's book, Lead, like Lincoln on Leadership, is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, actually, I've read so many over the years. Uh, it's Your Ship is uh, another one that was pretty fun about a uh, naval officer um, and bringing together the guys out on the big boat, making sure how did they work together. You know, when you're in close quarters with other people for a long time, you better get along. Uh, so that was a pretty interesting book. And actually, every year in my staff meeting, we bring a new book and read it together and share kind of what's your takeaway, what's your experience. Uh, but, I mean, it's really, there's so much out there on the web today that you can learn about very briefly. Uh, it just depends on, you know, what your passion is. Uh, but a lot of, you know, academic stuff on financials or business as well. Okay. Um, how did you learn to um, balance out your family time and all your work time since you seem so busy all the time? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, balance is personal. And people are always asking, you know, when are you going to take vacation? And my response often, well, vacation is a state of mind. I take mini vacations all day long. You know, 30-second time out, you know, you go somewhere, you're in the Caribbean for a moment, you come back. It's okay. Uh, I think that, you know, for my family time, which is a big priority for me, uh, you know, I schedule it. I schedule everything because I need to work off that calendar and be available for the team. Uh, but I, I think it's realizing that you only have 24 hours in the day, and when people say you can't get it all done, you know, you say, well, Mother Teresa got an awful lot done 24 hours a day, so I think we can figure this out. Uh, I think it's got to be personal, and it changes uh, when you... Uh, begin your, your journey and uh, maybe have a partner or a spouse in your life. Uh, your, your time and what you do is spent very differently than when you have young children or, or aging parents. And so you need to realize that that's going to change. And the key is to make sure you're open with your management uh, and your teams about you know, what you need to do to find that balance. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's one equation. And I remember years and years ago, a lot of women getting together to talk about work-life balance, work-life balance, and it, it, there's no formula. I mean, people are always saying, well, what's the magic equation? And, and honestly, it's personal. So one gentleman that I worked with had four young children at home, and he was in finance, and he would be in at 7.30 every morning, and he didn't leave till 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. This is when I was down in Kentucky. And I said, Ken, what is the matter? Why, wh why are you here? Well, I, I can't find time. And I said, now, why can't you come in on 9 o'clock on Wednesdays? and take the kids to school and go to McDonald's for breakfast. You're going to be here till 8 or 9 anyways. You really can't schedule that? Are you that bad at planning? And he's like, you're right. And the next week, he started to spend time you know, with his kids a little more often. And then you know, we also try to respect family time uh, for different individuals. So we know that certain people are doing things. So I think you know, personally, you just have to make it a priority. Um, I was given a deck of cards. I went through a lot of GE training over my years. And one important learning for me was we got a little deck of index cards. And on those were your important things in life, money, power, family, location, job, education, all things that might be important to you. And you were asked to sequence them, put them in order of what's most important to you. And then you look at your time. Are you spending time on what's most important to you or not? And if you're not, course correct. And I, to this day, look at where my time is spent and my calendar is color-coded on where I spend it personal time, you know, and uh, business time with my team and with different things so that I can do that analysis on a regular basis and make sure. And I also know when I'm out of kilter as well, when you need time off. 
But I think you've just got to make it a priority, just like you would other things that are important to you in life. Because uh, uh, years go by very quickly, and uh, moments get lost. So it's important that you make the time for each other. OK, let's thank uh, Michelle Markham once again. Thank you. Michelle, we're very grateful that you would come here and spend this morning with us. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate especially your optimism and your enthusiasm. Thanks for sharing that thank with you. us Thank you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, wow. Thank you. Talking about appreciation. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone.